warmly welcome to the Sunday edition of Daily News Simplified. Today we have taken the important articles from Indian Express and the Hindu and curated as per the demands of civil services examination. The topics for today's discussion are mentioned over your screen. So let's begin our session. The first topic for today's discussion is based on this article which appeared on Indian Express dated 12 July 2023. The context of this article is that India has initiated talks with Iraq to discuss the possibility of building liquefaction facilities in Iraq to convert the flared gas into liquefied natural gas. So proceeding in this discussion, it would be more clear that what is flared gas and what is this initiative all about. But we must know that Iraq is one of the top source of India's crude oil imports. But now as India aims to transition into a gas based economy. And for this, India needs to find out more prospects to increase its natural gas supply, either in terms of domestic production or exploring in other countries. So proceeding in our discussion, we will be seeing this news article in brief. Then we will discuss India's aim to transition into a gas based economy and what are the prospects for it and what are the challenges and way forward in this regard. So this theme is important for our GS paper one geography distribution of key natural resources across the world. And this is also important for our GS paper three economy under the syllabus head energy and infrastructure. So this news article says that India is looking for opportunities to develop liquefaction facilities in Iraq. And this is in order to convert the flared gas into liquefied natural gas. So let us understand what is gas flaring. And in order to understand this, let us first understand what is natural gas. Natural gas is a fossil fuel based energy resource. How was it formed? Natural gas and petroleum were formed over millions of years ago when tiny marine plants and animals died and they were buried on the ocean floor. These plants and animals were buried in the layers between the sedimentary rocks and over the time by enormous heat and pressure, they turned into oil and natural gas. So in this diagram, we can see that this is an impermeable rock. And here we can find the oil reserves and this blue colored area is natural gas. Natural gas deposits are often found near the oil deposits. And since it is lighter than oil, so it is found over the oil deposits. And now when this crude oil is extracted, this highly pressurized natural gas comes out of the surface. So in countries like Iraq, which are the major crude oil producers, gas flaring is a major problem because they have to burn this natural gas in absence of any infrastructure to convert this natural gas into LNG or in any other usable form. So gas flaring is the burning of this unwanted or unutilized associated natural gas produced during oil production. And now what India wants to do is to tap this natural gas by investing in infrastructure in Iraq and to convert it into LNG or any other usable form. And apart from this, gas flaring is a major problem in the oil producing countries. This is because of the two reasons. The first reason is pollution. Gas flaring produces an enormous amount of carbon dioxide, methane and other greenhouse gases. Apart from this, gas flaring releases many carcinogenic chemicals in the air and which has the potential of causing cancer and associated diseases in the population nearby. And now let's see some more facts about natural gas. Natural gas is a fossil fuel and the major composition of this fossil fuel is methane. This natural gas cannot be used in its original form and this natural gas has to be converted or processed into a cleaner fuel for consumption. And now let us see why is India interested in the natural gas reserves in Iraq. The government of India has set a target that by the year 2030, the share of natural gas in the total energy mix of India would be up to 15%. Presently, the total energy mix of India is dominated by thermal energy. And the share of natural gas in this total energy mix presently is around 6%. And by the year 2030, the government of India aims to increase the share to up to 15%. And for this, India needs to explore the possibilities of natural gas in its country, in its domestic territory. And also India has to see avenues for its imports from other countries. 
and natural gas is also significant because india needs to lower its greenhouse gases emissions and this would be used as a transition fuel in order to transition into a green economy now let us see what are the advantages of natural gas natural gas is the cleanest hydrocarbon fuel this is way cleaner as compared to coal and petroleum products another advantage is that natural gas is way cheaper as compared to petrol and diesel and one more significant advantage is that it is a diverse fuel natural gas can be used in domestic sector such as kitchen fuel this can be used for energy production and it can be used as a transportation fuel and presently the major use of natural gas in india is in fertilizer production additionally one more significant advantage is that it has a supply chain convenience natural gas can be shipped in pipelines and which makes natural gas easier to ship as compared to lpg now having seen the advantage of natural gas let us find the occurrence of natural gas in india or the locational distribution of natural gas the prominent natural gas reserves are in the kambe basin which is in gujarat hajira basin which is also in gujarat they are also present in the bombay offshore in the krishna godavari basin in the kaveri basin in tamil nadu and natural gas is also present in the north eastern india in the assam arakan basin so these are the prominent locations of india where natural gas is found so india is exploiting these natural gas reserves and apart from this presently india is importing 50% of its natural gas requirement so as we know that india wants to transition into a gas based economy but there are significant challenges which india faces in order to do so now let us see what are the challenges india is facing to transition into a gas based economy the first challenge which india faces is insignificant domestic gas production the recent government data shows that the production of natural gas in india is declining since past few years but at the same time the demand for natural gas is increasing and this demand will continue to increase in the future so it has been speculated that india has various untapped natural gas resources and further there is a lack of commercially viable natural gas fields in india and because of this insufficient domestic gas production india has to rely on imports to fulfill its energy requirement and which is going to escalate in future another significant challenge is that india has an inadequate gas pipeline infrastructure and regional balances in terms of this infrastructure so for this we can see this map of india the blue colored line shows the existing gas pipelines of india and this red color line shows the under construction pipelines in india so we can see that presently the distribution of pipelines is heavily favored for western part of india and on the same time there is an absence of this pipeline infrastructure in the central india eastern india and southern india so in the absence of infrastructure the major sectors will not be able to access natural gas and hence they cannot transition into a gas based economy and also in the regions where there is a gas pipeline infrastructure there are further regional imbalances another factor is the limited market for natural gas limited market means there are limited consumers or natural gas consumption is only dominated by a few sectors presently it is dominated by the fertilizer sector of india and we have already discussed that this lack of infrastructure further limits the market or limits the access to consumers for natural gas and apart from this there are limited producers of natural gas presently the exploration and production of natural gas in india is dominated by the state entities or the public sector undertakings so because of this there is a lack of competition in the market so there is a limited private sector investment in the natural gas sector even if it is present it is dominated by a few big players the transition to gas based economy is impacted by the fact that there is a lack of non discriminatory or open access for private sectors to access the government gas pipeline network this means that presently the major pipeline grid or the pipeline infrastructure is owned by public sector or by government so if any private sector has to supply natural gas they are bound to use that government pipeline infrastructure and for it they need an open access or a non discriminatory access and presently which is not transparent or it is favored in terms of few big market players another significant reason is 
affordability issues so presently the prices of natural gas in the country are controlled by the government and they are not determined by the market and also the prices of natural gas are not under gst so these prices could be set arbitrarily and this can cause the affordability issues and in order to solve this affordability issue india needs a market determined and transparent pricing mechanism and presently india lacks this mechanism another important factor is the lack of integrated energy sector presently the energy sector in the country is governed by multiple departments and ministry so there is fragmentation lack of coordination and incoherent policy implementation so let us see what is the way forward in this regard the first such measure could be expanding pipeline infrastructure in india india should target the regional markets and ensure that the regions with the highest demand for natural gas receive the adequate supply of natural gas and for this one significant initiative of the government is urja ganga project urja ganga project was launched by the government in the year 2016 this is also known as jagdishpur haldia bokaro and dhamra pipeline project and this project basically aims to cater the energy requirements of five states of india by creating a pipeline structure these states are uttar pradesh bihar jharkhand west bengal and odisha and under this project the total length of the pipeline presently is more than 3300 kilometers another step is by creating a unified and integrated energy ministry to enhance accountability and streamline governance in the energy sector and this integrated ministry is important for effective policy making and to implement long term strategies and since we saw that there is a lack of openness for private sectors to gas pipeline network hence there is a need to create an independent system operator which will ensure an efficient gas grid and fair allocation of pipeline uses another initiative could be by inclusion of natural gas under gst by bringing natural gas into gst will streamline the pricing of natural gas as it will avoid multiple taxes or tariffs imposed presently another initiative could be by rationalization of gas pipeline tariffs rationalization of gas pipeline tariffs or by adopting a single zone tariff will promote the affordability by reducing transportation cost and it will attract investment in the gas infrastructure also there is a need for uniform licensing for the producers so generally what happens is that there is a need for separate licensing in order to extract various products like oil or for any other product found in the surrounding so if there is a uniform licensing for all these products this will streamline the process and it would create more profit for the producers and in turn will increase the investment in the commercial exploitation of these resources and also the producers need to be given some kind of marketing freedom for gas produced from deep waters as the exploitation of gas from the deep waters is more costly so this is needed in order to ensure that such kind of exploration is profitable for the producers now these were the steps regarding the domestic production of natural gas and now india is importing a huge amount of natural gas so india needs to diversify its import and for that india has to go into strategic energy agreements with other energy rich countries for example india can explore natural gas or other petroleum products in the russian far east and also india can go into an alliance with the major gas importing countries like japan to have a better negotiating power against asian premium so what is asian premium it is the extra charge which the asian countries have to pay to the opec countries when they export crude oil in compared to the western countries and in the case of gas it is asian gas premium and finally india needs to expedite such as the tapi project which is long shelved and this is majorly because of the security reasons in afghanistan and because of other logistic challenges hence in order to transition into an energy based economy india needs right policy initiatives The next topic for today's discussion is inspired by the flood situation in Delhi. The context is that Delhi is experiencing its worst floods in 45 years. The Yamuna River has swollen with water and has broken the 45 year benchmark. And the last such floods appeared in Delhi in the year 1978. So this flood situation in Delhi 
is a culmination of natural factors and this has been escalated by the anthropogenic factors. This theme is important for us under the topic urban flooding and this is important for our GS paper 3 disaster management. Now in particular if we talk about the situation in Delhi, the reason for the floods were excessive rainfall in the mountain states of Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh. And because of this excessive rainfall, there was a heavy surge of water into the Yamuna river and which led to the increase in the water level in the Yamuna river. And at the same time, there was excessive rainfall in Delhi and in the adjoining areas of northern India, which also contributed to the flood situation in Delhi. And there was one more reason which has been considered as an immediate reason is that there was a release of water from the Hatinikund barrage in Haryana. And of these factors were compounded by the urban challenges in Delhi. Urban floods are different from rural floods with their own set of challenges because of their potential to impact the large number of population and can impact critical infrastructure in the urban areas. So let's talk about the anthropogenic reasons or the challenges in urban areas that can lead or escalate the situations of urban floods. The first such challenge is inadequate drainage systems. The drainage systems of Indian cities are often choked or outdated. The complex draining systems of Indian cities are designed to handle the normal flow of water. But in the case of extreme weather events or the extreme monsoon rainfall, the drainage systems are not able to handle this heavy inflow of water. So there are two reasons for it. One is the outdated design of the drainage system and the other is lack of maintenance of these drainage systems. Often the drains are choked with plastic pollution and hence in the case of extreme rainfall events this system can be overwhelmed and which can lead to flooding. Another issue is reduced absorption capacity of the river beds and water bodies in urban areas. So because of the challenges of urbanization to accommodate a huge population often the river beds and water bodies are encroached upon. There is a construction of infrastructure around the banks of rivers and water bodies and which leads permanent alterations to the natural river bed or to the watershed and further because of the construction activities there can be siltation and narrowing of water channels and this can reduce the capacity of these water bodies to carry water and hence in the case of extreme weather events these can overflow and may contribute to urban flooding. Another significant challenge is concretization of urban areas. The excessive use of concrete in the urban areas reduces the natural capacity of the ground to absorb rainwater. So instead of getting absorbed, this rainwater quickly runs off to the surfaces and which leads to flooding of drains. So in this regard, let us see way forward. The first important step is to develop a legally mandated drainage master plan. For any development in the urban areas, there should be assessment of the drainage system. There should be identification of the flood prone areas and there should be strategies to construct the drainage system on modern lines. So this calls for a planned drainage infrastructure. The other important step is the maintenance of drainage system. There should be regular maintenance, cleaning and desilting of drainage system. And especially before the onset of monsoon season, there should be steps towards cleaning and desilting of these drainage systems. Another step can be crackdown on drain encroachments. So these crackdown on the drain encroachments are necessary to preserve the natural flow of water and to increase the carrying capacity of the drainage systems. And there should be measures to ensure that the sewerage, plastic pollution and industrial effluents are not disposed in the stormwater drains. Another step can be to establish river basin authorities for ensuring proper coordination and management of dams and reservoirs. So this is to check the uncontrolled water release from these dams and reservoirs in the events of extreme rainfall. And finally, there can be enactment of a legislation which is similar to coastal zone regulation. Such kind of legislation is required to prevent or control unplanned development or encroachment in the riverbed plains. The next topic for today's discussion is based on this article which appeared on Indian Express. The context of this article is that Punjab Agriculture University has developed a new variety of wheat which has high amylose starch content and this variety of wheat is known to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. 
द अंडरलाइन थीम द अंडरलाइन थीम ऑफ दिस आर्टिकल इज फ्रॉम फूड सिक्योरिटी टू न्यूट्रिशनल सिक्योरिटी पंजाब एग्रीकल्चरल यूनिवर्सिटी हैड अर्लियर प्लेड अ पाइवटल रोल ड्यूरिंग द ग्रीन रेवोल्यूशन बाई डेवलपिंग हाई यील्डिंग वेराइटी ऑफ वीट एंड विच लेट इंडिया सरप्लस इन फूड ग्रेन प्रोडक्शन एंड नाउ द यूनिवर्सिटी इज डेवलपिंग अ न्यू वेराइटी ऑफ वीट विच एम्स टू प्रोवाइड न्यूट्रिशनल सिक्योरिटी बाय रिड्यूसिंग द रिस्क ऑफ दीज नॉन कम्युनिकेबल डिजीजेज सो दिस साइंटिफिक डेवलपमेंट एम्स टू चेक द राइजिंग नॉन कम्युनिकेबल डिजीजेज इन इंडिया सो इन दिस आर्टिकल वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट नॉन कम्युनिकेबल डिजीजेज इन इंडिया हाउ दे हैव बीन इंक्रीजिंग एंड दिस थीम इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अवर जी एस पेपर टू सोशल जस्टिस अंडर द सिलेबस हैड हेल्थ and this is also important for our gs paper 3 science and technology now let us briefly see about this new variety of wheat this new variety of wheat has a high amylose and is a resistant starch resistant starch functions as a prebiotic and it supports the growth of good bacteria in the gut it is called resistant starch because it is not digested in the small intestine rather this is fermented in the large intestine and because of this after the consumption of this wheat variety the glucose is released more slowly in the blood stream or this wheat variety has a lower glycemic index glycemic index is the value of how quickly food can increase blood sugar level so the foods which have low glycemic index are more desirable the food which have high glycemic index they fastly release glucose in the blood stream and because of which there is a spike in the blood sugar level and this spike in the blood sugar level is not desirable for a person who has diabetes non communicable diseases by their name imply that they are not caused by any infectious agents they are a group of chronic diseases which are developed over a long period of time the example of these non communicable diseases are cardiovascular diseases heart attack or heart stroke cancer diabetes chronic respiratory diseases and mental health disorders now what are the risk factors for non communicable diseases the major risk factor is improper diet the risk of these diseases is increased by the consumption of ultra processed food which are added with cosmetic additives high sugar high fat and high sodium content apart from this the sedentary lifestyle of the individuals like the lack of physical activity and also by the consumption of intoxicants like tobacco and alcohol are the added risk factors for the development of non communicable diseases further these diseases are also caused by pollution climate change and other environmental factors according to world health organization non communicable diseases account for 71% of all the global deaths and among all these ncds cardiovascular diseases were the leading cause of deaths and if we talk about india in 2019 alone around 66% of the total deaths were due to non communicable diseases and recently the reports of a decade long study by the indian council of medical research was published and an alarming fact from this study was that 31 million indians became diabetic in just 4 years and nearly 40% of the indian population was hit by abdominal obesity and the study also says that diabetes and other non communicable diseases such as hypertension obesity are much more common in india and earlier it was thought that these ncds are only increasing in the urban areas but the study have found that the rural india will see diabetes explosion in the next 5 years if the current pattern is left unregulated so to check the rising situation of ncds in india there are some government initiatives so one such initiative is that india has adopted a national action plan to reduce the number of global premature deaths from non communicable diseases by 25% by the year 2025 and this is in response to world health organization global action plan for prevention and control of non communicable diseases and in the lines of this action plan india launched national program for prevention and control of non communicable diseases so the initiatives under this program include setting up ncd clinics training healthcare providers raising awareness and providing free diagnostic services for the treatment of non communicable diseases other such initiative is the national tobacco control program by the government and since ncd also comprises of mental health disorders 
Hence, the government has launched a national mental health program. This program focuses on promoting the mental health. Apart from this, the flagship initiative of the government, Aishman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana, the program covers the treatment of various non-communicable diseases and provides health insurance. And when awareness scheme in this regard is Eat Right India movement. The movement has been launched by Food Safety and Standard Authority of India and one of the key goals of this movement is to make India transfat free. And finally, government has launched National Salt Reduction Initiative in order to create awareness for low intake of salt to prevent hypertension and related cardiovascular diseases. Now these are the initiatives in the healthcare domain by the government to prevent NCDs. Apart from these, there can be other initiatives like the scientific advancement by using genetic engineering. As we saw in the case of Punjab Agricultural University and one more step in this regard to provide nutritional security is food fortification. The final topic of today's discussion is based on this article which appeared on Indian Express dated 10 July 2023. So the context of this article is that recently the union cabinet has approved the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2023 which is to be tabled in the upcoming monsoon session of the parliament. So this is the second attempt by the government to bring a comprehensive legislation for the protection of personal data. Earlier in the year 2022, government bought such a bill and the revised version of this bill is expected to be floated in the monsoon session of the parliament. Now this personal data protection bill is important for our GS paper 2 polity and governance. This is important under the syllabus head government policies and interventions. This topic is also important for our GS paper 3 science and technology. We as an individuals are generating an enormous amount of data. This is through the login into some particular websites to assess any services. We enter our information and this personal data can include our name, address, contact details, our health records, financial data or any other kind of data. And when we are entering our any kind of personal data in any digital platform and that digital platform is collecting our data and it can process it for any purpose. It can be for any lawful purpose that is to provide us any service. For example, in the Aadhaar card, government processes the biometric details and other details of any individual to provide them services, say health services through Ayushman scheme or say job to Manrega workers. So this data can be used to provide us any service. And apart from this, there can be some illegal or unlawful use of our data. Our data could be profiled and this data can be sold to any third party and which can use this data to provide us targeted advertisement, any targeted service and also this can be used by cyber criminals for any nefarious purposes. Hence, the data is the new oil or data is the new currency in this digital economy. So in the recent years, there have been debate over the privacy and ownership of this data which we have entered in any digital platform. Whether this data belongs to us or whether our privacy is ensured by this data fiduciaries which are collecting our data. Data fiduciaries are the companies who are collecting our data. So in order to ensure the privacy of any individual, Supreme Court has given an important judgment which is the K.S. Puttaswamy judgment in the year 2017. So in this judgment, the Supreme Court has said that the right to privacy is an intrinsic part of the Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. So ever since this judgment, there has been significant development for protecting the personal data and privacy of individuals. And hence for this purpose, government aims to bring a comprehensive personal data protection law which aims to provide the fine balance between the rights of individual to protect their personal data and the need for data to be processed lawfully. Presently, the official content of the revised bill is not available and this topic will be covered more comprehensively once the bill is tabled in the parliament. But for now, these are the major highlights of the bill. The bill says that the personal data may be processed only for a lawful purpose for which an individual has given a consent. So this bill says that the individual have to give consent before their data is processed. And every individual must know that 
what personal data is being collected and what is the purpose of collection of such data the data fiduciaries which are the data collecting entities they will be obligated to maintain the accuracy of data collected and they have to keep the data secure and they have to delete the data once its purpose has been met the provisions of this bill are applicable while processing digital data within india and also when this data is being processed outside india or by any digital fiduciary which is located outside india apart from this the bill grants the individuals the right to obtain information seek correction and eraser the individuals are also given the right for grievance redressal and for this purpose a data protection board will be established and this will be an authority which will be responsible for the enforcement of the provisions of this bill and this regulatory body will adjudicate the non compliance with the provisions of the bill and data protection board can impose penalties on the data fiduciaries or organization in case they are found to violate the data protection rules or in the event of a personal data breach presently the penalties on the data fiduciary are proposed up to rupees 500 crores in the event of any data breach and one important fact about this bill is that it exempts the government agencies from applications of the provisions of the bill in public interest and this public interest can be and this public interest can be preserving the sovereignty and integrity of india in the security of the state to maintain friendly relations with the foreign states or for the maintenance of public order so we can see that some government agencies are exempt from the applications of the provisions of the bill now let us see the wider significance of this data protection bill the first major significance is that it fills the legislative gap in the country regarding the protection of any personal data and it will provide a dedicated legal framework for collection storage processing and transfer of personal data and will address the concerns regarding privacy so another important significance of this bill is that it will protect the consumer interest this is by safeguarding the sensitive data of the consumers and by safeguarding the sensitive data will build the consumer trust in the digital ecosystem it also protects consumer interest by strengthening the data protection measures by placing obligations on the entities that is by making the entities accountable for the data processed by them and finally this data protection bill is in alignment with the global data protection norms presently the general data protection regulation of the european union is the best example of data protection and privacy and hence a robust privacy law in india is in alignment with this global standards and it will facilitate smooth data transfers or in trade negotiations with these countries that prioritize privacy having seen the significance of this bill let us see some major concerns associated with it the first major concern is that it gives a blanket exemption to the government so because of which it is feared that by misusing the provisions of this bill the executive can engage in arbitrary actions another major issue is that the independence of the data protection board is being questioned and this is because the appointment of the chairperson and members of this data protection board is at the hand of the government and this will become a problem in any case the government is also a party to any dispute and in that case the credibility of this data protection board may be questioned another important concern is that this bill may impact on the right to information this is because the personal data of any government functionary is likely to be protected under the act and this may become difficult to pass on that information to any rti activist or any rti applicant so this is all for today we will discuss more about this bill once it is tabled in the parliament so this brings an end to today's session stay connected for more updates thank you